Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the first instalment of our Whistle Stop Tour of Tanakh, where we're going to be focusing specifically on Trey Asa. Today we are going to do a general introduction and I want to begin by asking you how many of you have heard or read Macbeth, Oliver Twist, Jane Eyre, or maybe let's make this more modern, Harry Potter. I'm assuming every single one of you has at least heard of, if not read, one of those works of English literature. Um, in contrast, how many of you have heard of or read Habakkuk, Ovadia, Sophania? These are prophets whose work is included in our Tanakh, in the Bible, and they are works that we are going to be looking at in Trey Asa in our series to try and understand what is important about them and what lessons can we take from them today. I recently gave a share for the United Synagogue before Shavuot on their uh, Facebook channel and YouTube channel uh, about the importance of Tanakh study, specifically Nakh study today in the 21st century and how it is relevant and important to us today. I recommend anyone who hasn't watched that shir to go and watch it, it's still available, it's called their pre-shavuot lunch and learn sessions. Um, it will give quite a good overview to Tanakh study in general and a bit of a good um, sort of introduction to this series. But don't worry if you haven't watched it, I will hopefully still reiterate and emphasize how important it is for us to study every aspect of the Tanakh to see what lessons we can learn from it to our, and, and bring them into our lives today. So again, this series is going to look at Treasa. We will spend today on an introduction and then after this, every session we'll look at one of the different 12 books or 12 books of Treasa. Each session will be an overview of each book where we try to understand the main message the, the, the prophet himself, the time period he lived in, and what he was trying to say to his generation, and what he's trying to say also to our generation today. Don't worry, each one will be standalone. Obviously, the introduction today is going to be quite useful for all of the future shirim, all of the sessions, but each one after this will be standalone. So don't worry if you can't make them all. They'll be saved, though, on the YouTube channel, on the Facebook, for you to watch later if you can't make it during the lunch and learn session. Please do contact me with any feedback, any questions. My um, email address is at the bottom of the source sheet, learnwithpanina at gmail.com. I really would welcome any questions. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to do three things. We're going to look at what Treasar is. Two, we're going to look at a historical overview of the different books with a chart that can be referred back to. And finally, we'll look a little bit into the role of prophecy and what it means to us and the role of a prophet and so on. So we're going to do an overview of Treasar, an overview of the history, historical context and what is a prophet in general. So let's begin with our first question, what is Treasa? Now, Treasa is Aramaic and it literally translates as 12. Um, so it means 12 books. Now you see, interestingly, in early literature, so if we look now at our source sheet, by the way, obviously I'm sharing my screen so that you can see the source sheet in front of you. Um, it's also available to download and print off if you would like to. Uh, the link should be um, available on the somewhere on the United Synagogue's uh, Facebook page or, or website. So here we see in the early sources, um, for example, this Tosefta Megillah, which is from the third or second century of the Common Era. I'm not going to read the whole source, I just want to show you what I've highlighted here in red, that it's called Shnemasa in Hebrew, the Hebrew word for 12 here is used. So we see that in early sources it was called by its Hebrew term, um, but later became changed to the Aramaic term. We also see here in the Gemara, Masechet Baba Batra, in source number two, but they also call it Shnemasa using the Hebrew. So you may think it's strange, well, why do we now use the Aramaic term Treasa? And I think it's quite simple. 
In that time, that was the common language spoken by the Jewish people, just like the Talmud was written mostly in Aramaic because that was the language used at the time. So too, this became, they just became accustomed to using the Aramaic term treasa, and that's how what stuck. And um, it's not the names of the prophets. It's not. It's just literally describing that there were twelve books. So I don't think there's any issue with the fact that they ended up calling it in the Aramaic terms. It doesn't really matter, um, but that's just a little insight into the, the the language used at the time and so on. It's just interesting for us to think, oh, this is, you know, interesting that there's an Aramaic term that we're using the whole time without even maybe realizing it. So what is it? I've said it's 12. What what's, So it's 12 books of prophecies, 12 different works of prophets. Now, if you look here, who wrote it? In the Gemara Masechet Baba Batra 15a in source number two, there is a very long discussion there in the Gemara about who wrote all the different books of Tanakh. And it says here, Anshe Knesset Gdola Kutvu Yecheskel Shnemasa Daniel Umigilat Esther. That the men of the great assembly wrote the books of Ezekiel. The 12 books of the prophets, Daniel and Esther, the scroll of Esther that we read on Purim. Now, the men of the great assembly were established by Ezra. So at the end of the period of the Tanakh, Ezra is one of the latest works of the Tanakh. And so we're talking about approximately 500 or so BCE. Um, around the time of the return of the Jews to Israel after the Babylonian exile, the beginning of the, uh, the second, beginning of the second temple period, the men of the great assembly was established to give some sort of leadership and direction to the people. And um, they included people such as Mordechai, he was one of the Anshei Knesset Gedola, and the last ones, um, the later um, Men of the Great Assembly included also the last of the prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, who also formed part of the Treasa. So we're going to learn about them later on. But what does it mean? So the Men of the Great Assembly wrote these books. How do we understand that? It doesn't mean they wrote word for word. Most of the commentators will explain that it means they edited and compiled and put it together. What does that mean? Well, let's take Yechezkel, for example, Ezekiel. Most of the book of Yechezkel is written in first person. They're prophecies that he wrote himself. What happened? The Men of the Great Assembly took all of his you know, he had all different, maybe let's say, scrolls around his house, and they put it together into one book. They edited it and compiled it together. They decided what should be included. Likewise, with the books of the 12 prophets, they put them together, they compiled it into one book. It doesn't mean they wrote the prophecies, they were written by the prophets themselves. Now, um, imagine it's like someone wants to publish today a volume of the poems of William Wordsworth, they're not writing the poems. They're taking already written poems of Wordsworth and deciding how to put them together, which ones to include, and they're going to publish it into one new volume. Okay, so that's the difference in terms of the writing and the maybe compiling together. So the men of the Great Assembly compiled together the book of 12 prophets. So obviously your next question is, well, why? Why did we need to put 12 prophetic works together into one book called Asa. So if we move now, Dan, I'm going to zoom out here on my source sheet so you can see this whole source together. And source number three, it's quite a long source. We're going to look at different bits of it as we go through. I want us to focus here. This is Bhava Vatra 14b from the Gemara. We're going to look at this bottom underlined bit where it asks the question, why was this? The question we just asked, why are 12 works put together into one volume? And it explains there in the Gemara, Velichtevea, Lechudia, Velich Demaya, Adie de Zuta, Miyakes, that they were put together because of a fear that they would get lost because they're very small. If you think about it, we're going to look soon at the chart. We're going to see Avadia was only one chapter long. Uh, Yona and Yoel are only four chapters long. They were written in those days on a scroll. Imagine you've got a tiny scroll with only about 20 or so verses on it for Avadia. That's going to be pretty tiny once you scroll it all up together. And imagine putting that on the bookshelf in a library, in a Beit Midrash, in a shul, in a yeshiva, in a school. It's 
going to very easily get lost that one volume of Avadia's one prophecy. So what did they do? The men in the great assembly decided let's put it all together into one volume so that it won't get lost really because of its size. Now, Trey Asa is often translated into English as the 12 minor prophets, which I think is a bit unfair because it makes them seem less important. They seem minor. They're not minor from a significance or a, an importance point of view. They're more just small from a physical size, and therefore they were put together in order that they not get lost. I should also point out that the Radak, there is an opinion of the Radak, who was a medieval commentator living at the end of the 1100s, early 1200s, he does say at the beginning of his commentary to the Treasa, the Redak adds that actually they were conceptually smaller, they were conceptually less important than the other bigger works of prophecy, therefore they were put together from a because they were less important. That's just one opinion though, I just thought I should point, let you know it, but generally I'm gonna follow the mainstream view of, it's not because they're less important, but because they were just small. There is one, uh, one other thing I want to point out here about the Treasa. So these 12 works were very similar to the other later works of the Prophet. So what do I mean by this? If you look here again in source number three at the beginning where I've highlighted it here for you in grey, trying to make it uh, reader printer friendly for those of you who want to um, save your coloured ink for your children's artwork or things like that. So I've tried to make this more uh, printer friendly. Generally, I like putting loads of colours on my source sheets, but here I've, I've tried to stay away from it. They discuss here the order of the books of Tanakh. Okay, so Tanah Rabbanan, Sidran, Shel, Nevi'im. The rabbis discuss the order of the prophets, of, remember, the, the prophets, um, if we talk about the Tanakh, the Bible, the Tanakh, Tanakh is an acronym for the Torah, the five books of Moses at the beginning, then the Nun is the Nevi'im, the um, works of prophecy, and then the the, the, the Chaf there is the Ketuvim, the writings, the works such as Tehillim or the, the Megillot and so on. So they talk here about the order of just the Navi in the middle works of the prophecy, the middle bit of the Tanakh, and here's the order that they give. Um, Yahshua, the Shoftim, Shmuel, or Malachim, Gimiyahu, the Yecheskel, Yishai, the Shnemasa. Okay, so it's actually really interesting. If you look at the order carefully, they've got Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, which we have. Then, Yirmiya, Yechezkel, Yeshaya, and Treyasa. We actually don't have this order. Yeshayahu here comes before Yirmiyahu. So just to um, just as a side point, that's another discussion, which we don't have time to get into why it's different here to our actual order in Atanas. But... Um, we see here that there's a division between the earlier prophets and the later prophets. If you look here, I've put for you a, a breakdown here of the Nevi'im, where we see that these earlier works, where I've circled in blue, these are the Nevi'im Rishonim, the early prophets. So we've got um, the stories, really. These are quite, um, from a stylistic point, these two different works, the Nevi'im Rishonim and the Nevi'im Rachronim that I've circled in red, they are quite different from a stylistic point of view. The Nevi'im Rishonim are stories, are um, the events of what happened with the conquest of the land of Israel and down to the, all the kingships and what happened with the, then eventually the destruction of the temple and the exile by the Babylonians, that, which is how Malachim ends, the Book of Kings. That's um, the early prophets, the Nevi'im Roshonim. Then the later prophets, the Nevi'im Achronim, are more the prophet standing on a soapbox, giving his word of, giving over the word of God to the people, just like I've shown you in this picture here with a prophet sort of standing on some sort of makeshift stage with a crowd of people at his feet listening. So the, it's not a chronological difference. Um, the Nevi'im Roshonim and the Nevi'im Achronim, it sounds like it's earlier and later, therefore it's a chronological thing. There is a very big overlap. All of these later prophets really are taking place during the time period of the Malachim, of the kings. So it's not necessarily chronological difference, but also a stylistic difference of more historical story-based things versus um, prophecies to 
um, give over the word of God to the people. And we see very much so that the Trey Asa that we're going to be looking at totally fits this stylistic um, version of the later prophets of Navi standing on his soapbox giving over the word of God to the people, which I think is uh, a relevant thing to be pointing out to that that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, so let's now move on then to the second part of the year. So to summarise the first part of this session, we've talked about the Treyasa being a compilation of 12 different prophetic works edited and compiled by the Anshay Knesset Hagdola and, and put in the Tanakh for um, us because they were worried if it was all together that they were so small it would get lost. So fine, let's look at what's actually included then in the Treyasa. Um, so I've, I've tried to give you a bit of an overview of the main points here in the chart without oversimplifying anything too much. And I've put here the list of the prophets in their, with their English name and their Hebrew name here. Um, this is the order that they appear in the Tanakh. And this is the order in which I will be going through them. Um, so for example, our first session will be on Hashem next week. This, after the introduction, we will begin with Hosea next week. See, Hosea is the one of the biggest ones. Hosea and Zechariah are the biggest ones with 14 chapters. I've put here for you um, in this column when we read them as part of our Haftarah, because obviously the, the weekly Haftarah is many of us, that's the only time we're really looking at Nach and looking at the Nevi'im. Some of these don't ever feature as part of our Haftarah, so they're really not known about at all. And we'll see, I think it's just interesting, if I can, I'll try and explain why it's used as that particular Haftarah, but I don't know if we'll necessarily have time for that every week. But it's just interesting to see when they're part of our traditional readings on a Shabbat morning. And I've put here the general context. So Hoshea, for example, comes in the first temple period. Um, you'll see here now, if we go on to the second one, Yoel, which is much smaller of four chapters, it's disputed. We do not know the time period and the context of when this Navi lived. And we'll talk about that at length when we get to him. Then we have Amos, also first temple period, Ovadia, here the smallest um, disputed time period. We have Yona, the most famous of the Treyasa. Probably Yona is one of the most famous prophets, actually, in the books of Tanakh, um, because we read the story of Yona on Yom Kippur in that afternoon. And fascinating story. I, I look forward to that session with you very much. Then we're going to have uh, Micha, who was also in the first temple period. Um, then Nachum is disputed, Habakkuk is disputed, Sophania comes uh, at the end of the first temple period and he is not really known about because no Haftorah there. Then we have Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi who are all um, feature, you'll see I've put here at the bottom some uh, a star footnote, they are the last three prophet, prophets and they are the members of the Anshayi Knesset of Gadola. So we see here that they are at the beginning of the second temple period, we see here that the time period spans well over 350 years from the middle of the first temple period to the beginning of the second temple period. So we really do have to be careful each time to ask, well, when is this person living? What's the time period? What's going on with the people at the time? To try and understand exactly what the message is. And it's difficult because it's different for each of them. And we really are looking at a massive time span of Jewish history. Now, just to point out, you might wonder why, um, why this order? Now, you'll see Hoshea, Amos, and Micha. Why have I highlighted them in yellow? Because they prophesied at the same time. If I, I'll just show you quickly if we scroll back to source number three up here, back to our Baba Batra 14b. You see here where it's written in bold, how we, where it says this. So, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Shehayat Chila La'aba Anavi Imshin Nabuba Oto Perek. Rabbi Yochanan is talking about Hoshea here, and he says that he was the first of four prophets who prophesied at the same time. And who are they? Eluhein, Hoshea, Yeshea, Amos, Umicha. That Hoshea, Yeshayahu, Amos, and Micha all prophesied at the same time. These four prophets prophesied together. Um, so you might think, oh, so if they're prophesying at the same time, obviously Yeshayahu has his own book alone, on his own. But you'd think that these three, Hoshea, Amos, and Micha, that I've put in yellow for you here, that they should um, come one after the other because they're chronologically together. You see here that they're not, that they're separated. Now, obviously, 
we do have a chronological element here at the end because Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi do form the final prophets and they come at the end of this period. So I just want to point out that there's a mix here between his, a chronological element to the ordering, but there's also a content element to the ordering. What do I mean? For some of them, Anche Knesset and Kodola thought, oh, let's put these two together because they discuss a similar thing, such as, I'll give you one example, Yona. Yona, the story uh, of Yona is all about him prophesying to Nineveh and, prevent, and, and the story is that they are not destroyed because they do to Shiva. Nineveh being the capital city of Ashur, the kingdom of uh, the, the empire, I should say, of Assyria. And Micha talks about the future destruction of Ashur, of Assyria. Therefore, we have this link in them both being prophecies that concern Assyria. They also both talk about the Rachamim, the mercy of Hashem. Yona is about Hashem's ability to forgive and have mercy and not destroy them. And also Micha talks at the end, he has the Yud Gimel Midot Rachamim, the 13 principles of attributes, sorry, the 13 attributes of mercy that Hashem has. So they're linked in terms of prophecies about Ashur and the idea of Hashem's mercy. So I'll try and refer to this as I can when we go when relevant, but again, just to point out to you that the order here is both chronological and um, based on the content and conceptual, I should say. So that's just to give you a bit of an overview of what, who is in the Trey Asa. Again, each one will need to be discussed in turn. Um, now let's talk about the final part of my session today where I want to look at so what's the relevance of all this and what is the role and relevance of prophecy anyway to us you may be wondering firstly what all this means to me why is this important it was written in the Tanakh so many years ago these people lived so long ago why is this relevant to me I want to again reiterate and emphasize a point that I've mentioned before and some of you will have heard, but I think it's so important it's worth repeating. Every prophecy recorded in our Tanakh is recorded there because it has importance for all of future generations. How do I know this? In source number four, you can see the Gemara and Masechet Megillah 14a talks about there, talks about the number of prophets. And it says there were 48 prophets and seven prophetesses. And the Gemara asks, really? Only this number? So small? Why does it wonder? Well, it uses a Pasuk from Shmuel, the book of Samuel, where it talks about Elkanah, Elkanah and Hannah, who became the parents of Shmuel, Hanavi, Sam, uh, Samuel, who, who anointed the first king of Israel. And it describes Elkanah there as Vihi ish achad min haramataim tzofim. There was one man who lived in Ramataim tzofim. But Chazal take it further and say, no, it doesn't just mean that. It means that there was one man, meaning one, from 200 prophets, 200 coming from the word Ramatayim, because it sounds similar to Matayim, and Sophim, which is another word for prophet. So he was one from 200 prophets that lived in his generation. And the Gemara says, well, if there were 200 prophets in the generation of Elkanah, then surely there were more than 48 on the, over all the time period that it's, prophecy existed. And the Gemara takes the question further, saying else that, that it says there were more, there were double the number of prophets than the were of, of people who came out of Egypt. Meaning we're talking about in the millions, the Gemara says. There were over a million prophets. Therefore, how, again, can the Gemara say that there are only 48? And the answer here is so fundamental. It's saying there were only 48 written in Tartanach. Why? I'm reading here where it's underlined at the end of source four. Rather, prophecy that was needed for the generations was written down. And if it wasn't needed, it wasn't written down. Fundamental here, meaning that everything that is included in our canon, in our Tanakh, is there because it had a message for all of future generations. There were other works of prophecies. There were other prophets. There were other prophecies that were probably written down but they weren't included in our Tanakh because they didn't have significance for future generations and just to emphasize this a bit more in um 
in Qumran, near the Dead Sea, in the caves there, they found, they made a monumental discovery in the last uh, century, where they discovered scrolls that had been preserved there due to the conditions. Scrolls that are word for word the same as our traditional texts. For example, if you go to um, the Israel Museum, to the Shrine of the Book, Heichala Sefer, you can see the Book of Yeshayahu are on display from nearly around 2,000 years ago. That is word for word what we have today. It's amazing. But on top of that, they also found lots of other scrolls, lots of other writings that we haven't preserved. At Qumran lived a different sect, the Essenes, who had a slightly different tradition, different customs, and so on. And they had other scrolls there of prophecies written by Yeshayahu, that we didn't include in our Tanakh because they weren't necessary, they weren't significant for future generations, but their scenes thought were important for whatever reason, showing that Yeshayahu had other prophecies, but again, only these specific ones were included in the Tanakh for a reason, showing again that Chazal decided what to include and what not to include based on the importance it would have for later generations. So again, I reiterate that these 12 prophets of Treas are not minor, they are highly significant. The fact that they were included in our canon and put into the Tanakh show that they are necessary for eternity and for future generations that is an important message for us. Another question you might be wondering, which I will probably finish with now, is, but why do we need so many prophets? Aren't all these prophets surely just saying the same thing? Why do we have 12 prophets here? Aren't they all just telling us to serve Hashem and keep the Torah? Why do we need so many? And even more than that, why were the Navi clusters? Why are the prophets who live at the same time? Okay, I showed you the Kabara earlier. Hoshea, Yeshayahu, Amos and Micha all lived at the same time. Why do we need four prophets at the same time period? So here is where I want to say something which is quite important about the role of a prophet and the idea of prophecy. Every prophet was able to employ his own methods, his own expression, his own styles into how he chose to give his prophecy over to the people. Just like a teacher, I might, one teenager might really like the regimented, disciplined English teacher who they always know exactly what to expect in the lesson, they know what homework they'll get, when it's due, it's always the same every lesson. Whereas another student might much prefer the more easygoing, relaxed, chilled atmosphere of their maths teacher, for example, that works much better for them. Different methods work for different students in the classroom, so too different methods work for different adults when you're talking about prophecy giving over the prophets giving over the word of God. And to show you this in the Gemara in the Sanhedrin 89a it says Signon Echad Olela Kama Nabiim the Inchne Nabiim it Nabim the Signon Echad. One prophecy, one vision can be given to a number of prophets, but no two prophets will prophesy with the same style, will use the same expression, meaning and they have the ability to be creative. We'll look at this as we go through each one in turn. Some of them is a question, did this happen? Is this just their creativity of how they chose to give their message across to the people? We'll talk about that next week specifically with Hoshea. Likewise, I should also just add that they had different roles because they had they, different backgrounds. For example, Yeshayahu was from the royal family. He spoke the language of the court. He knew the etiquette. He didn't, wasn't phased to go and talk to the king and the royal family. So he was the Navi of the Melech, of the king. Whereas Amos, who prophesied at the same time, Amos was a commoner. He was a shepherd. He spoke the language of the normal people. He could go and talk and, and reach the commoners, the, 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 the normal population, the simple people. So we see that each Navi has a different background, has a different style, has a different ability to get a message across to the people. That's why each Navi is so important to look at each one in turn as an individual, not just at their time period and their location, but also their personality, the background that they're bringing to their role of a Navi and how they are able, therefore, to put that into their job. So, to bring the session to a close, 
we have looked at what Treyasa is, that it was 12 separate works put together by Ansheikh Nessa Agdola because they're very small and they feared that they would get lost. We've looked at a brief overview of what all the books are and maybe their time period and a little bit of information about them. We have asked some questions about the role of a prophet and the importance of prophecy to us today in 2020. And I hope I have really shown you how important each one of these books is, how important it is for us to study each one in turn, which is very rarely done, and to try and see what their message is to us today. Again, I ask you to contact me with any questions or any feedback. My, my email address again, learnwithkamina at gmail.com here at the bottom of the source sheet. And please do join us the same time next week where we will do a lunch and learn session on the first of the Treyasa Shea. Thank you for listening and have a great day.